Hello, and welcome to this new video uh, on the DLVO theory of colloidal stability. In this video, we'll wrap up what we have seen in the three previous lectures regarding the van der Waals interaction between two colloids across a particular medium and the electrostatic interaction mediated by ions in solution. And so, uh, I remind you that in the very last part of the first lecture, we outlined what was uh, the heart of the DLVO theory between any two colloids. It would say that what matters are basically two interactions which are competing with each other. This is, uh, on the one hand, the colloid-colloid van der Waals interaction in solution, and on the other hand, the colloid-colloid electrostatic interaction in solution. Now, I had emphasized that van der Waals interaction was owing to charge fluctuations in neutral objects, which basically comprise the bulk part of the colloids, while the electrostatic interaction was owing to the colloid's net charge, which is carried at the surface of these colloids. We have seen in the last three lectures that basically the van der Waals interaction reads like so, and the Amaker constants A12 can be either positive or negative depending on the medium in between the two colloids we are looking at. So this was due to an improvement of Lifshitz uh, um, of the uh, initial formula from Hamaker. Of course, since then, there has been many uh, also improvements uh, on the method itself, on the whole equation, and also even on the Lifshitz method. However, for what we want to do, this is plenty. Now, we have seen as well that the um, ion-mediated electrostatic interaction uh, could be given by the Debye Huckel pair potential. Okay, this is holding most of the time if you have a monovalent salt, which is only plus and minus ions, and where they are sufficiently far from each other. But for what again we want to do, that will be enough. This particular potential reads Q1F. Okay, so Q1 effective times Q2 effective divided by 4 pi epsilon m, where epsilon m is the dielectric permittivity of the surrounding medium, and then times a, sc a screened Coulomb potential, which goes as exponential minus r divided by lambda d, and the whole thing divided by r. Now, most of the time in colloid science, we are interested in the interaction between two colloids of the same kind. And in this particular case, these two equations simplify in the following way. So you see that the van der Waals interaction is, is simplified quite significantly, where basically you only have capital R, which is a radius of the particle appearing. The second term is very simple, it's simply the ratio uh, of the radius by the center to center distance squared. And the log term as well is simplified. Regarding the electrostatic term, it's basically Q effective squared, and that's the only part that is really changed. Now in the standard DLVO theory, we don't really do things by looking at this equation and staring at them. What we do is actually we plot them, and then we see how the sum of these two terms will actually give rise to different qualitative features of interaction depending on the values of the parameters. And that's what we'll look just now. So here, for example, I have plotted the Coulomb potential, the Debye Huckel per, per, per potential, the Van der Waals potential, and the sum of the two uh, in black, okay? So just to give you the color code, the Coulomb potential will be in red and dashed line, the Debye Huckel per potential would be in red but then plain line, then in blue you would have the Van der Waals potential of interaction, and finally the sum of the two is in black. All right? Now the plus for you to understand is the interaction energy in units of KBT at room temperature, and then um, uh, uh, versus the 
center to center distance in micrometers. The parameters that I've used in this plot is that the double eye length is 100 micrometers, so charge of the colloid uh, is 100 uh, elementary charges, um, the Heimacher constant is 20 kbt, and the radius of the particles is 1 micron. Now, what you see here is that the Coulomb and de uh, potential are basically uh, indistinguishable. You can't really see uh, which one is who because they are on top of one another. And this is understandable because the screening length, right, is 100 micron, which is about 10 times the actual uh, uh, distance we cover on this plot. And so that's kind of normal that they just are the same in this particular case, because it will take 10 times more to see any significant uh, difference between them. The van der Waals interaction between two like uh, colloids to, um, to uh, identical colloids would be always attractive, and that's what we see with the blue curve always going down. The Coulomb potential, because it's simply plus Q effective squared, will be always repulsive. And the sum of the two in black will be repulsive uh, for this particular case, repulsive, and then attractive at very short range with basically a very, very, very strong attraction at very, very short range. And that's because the van der Waals interaction goes in the worst case scenario as 1 over L, and the Dubai Huckel potential goes exponentially, uh, you know, it decays exponentially. So that changes dramatically how these things uh, work eventually. Now, the um, if I were to try to understand the physics in this particular case, we could make these two particles or two colloids uh, interact and see how the colloid on the right would actually move along this, um, this, pay, this energy landscape given by u van der Waals plus u de Bayekel, given that he has, has been given a kick uh, of uh, amplitude kbt. So the left colloid is not bulging, okay, it's not moving, and then the right one will be moving toward him, uh, and we'll see how far it can go. So in this particular case, you imagine a, a kick kbt, then it's going, it's basically climbing up, but eventually when it reaches about 1 or 1.2 kbt, then of course it can't go like really further, because it doesn't have enough energy to actually do that. This is like stuttered, if you will, classical mechanics. Uh, wisdom. Uh, of course, in, st in, in thermodynamics, it's a little bit more complicated. The only thing we can say is that it's very, very unlikely for these particles to, meet, to ever meet. Now, uh, what we say in the, in the jargon of colloid physics uh, is that basically this suspension of colloids will therefore be charge-stabilized suspension. Okay, therefore, what it means is that they are so repulsive due to their charges that they will never meet each other and they, st they still continue simply moving around um, and then in a dilute suspension and nothing goes on. Their colloid properties are still the same and they won't really sediment uh, unless you wait for like very, very, very long times. But that's due to the fact that there is a strong repulsion uh, that is almost of the kind of Coulomb, direct Coulomb potential. Maybe if you were to decrease the Dubai screening length, then we would see a difference. So if we do, for example, uh, look like at uh, Dubai screening length, which is, which is uh, 10 micron, then we do see a difference between the Coulomb potential and the Dubai Huckel per potential. Okay, so Dubai 1, of course, the Dubai Huckel is always below the Coulomb potential because of the screening. The sum of the two is still quite, uh, still this shape where it, it, it reaches a maximum, so there is a, a potential energy barrier, and then it goes down again. The top of the barrier, however, is now lower than 2 kbt, it's about 1.85 kbt, uh, and this shows that eventually, uh, the, the barrier is, of course, decreasing as the um, screening length is decreased. 
if I were to take my example uh, from before, where I have these two particles, one waiting uh, the, just gently and patiently on the left, and another one receiving on the right a K KBT, then it will go up, like this, and then again reaching about 1 or 1.2 KBT, essentially the, it, it becomes increasingly harder to simply go up, and then it will just be pushed along, uh, away from the particle. So again, here we are in a case of charge stabilized suspension. They would not meet uh, each other, at least it's very, very unlikely. What happens if we were to look at lambda d is equal to 2 micron, for example? Then in this case, it's basically the same picture. You see, like graphically, it's the same picture. Uh, you've got a barrier that is still there. When you look at the total curve, u van der Waals plus, plus uh, u de by Huckel. However, the scenario is actually entirely different. Why? Because if you have a kick of um, uh, basically magnitude kBT, then even in classical mechanics, you have enough, let's say, kinetic energy to actually move past this barrier. And in fact, if you have this particular kick that is done, then eventually this particle will go uh, at the top of the barrier and then fall down um, and, and then touch or kiss the other particle. Now you need to realize that once a particle actually kisses the other one, then it has to be uh, put still on the dark line, okay? And the dark line, as you see, is actually very, very, very low. It's minus 2 and probably even at, at contact, really, it's probably even minus 10 or minus 20 or minus like uh, 100 kT, etc. So, so basically these two particles are now in a well, potential well, out of which they can't go. Okay, and therefore when they um, aggregate like this, it's impossible to reverse this particular thing, so it's an irreversible uh, process, and they just aggregate like this, and no, most of the time when this happens for two, then it will happen for three, etc., and it will grow a cluster uh, of big chunk of, of colloids that have, co that have basically coagulated with each other, and eventually these big chunks will simply sediment. Okay, so when we talk about something like that, then what it means is that the colloid criterion I've given before is ruined entirely because the colloids, the colloidal particles we are we are uh, we have in the solution are actually aggregating and forming lumps that are not colloidal anymore. So in this case, we talk about unstable or coagulating suspension. Okay, and most of the time, this is not something we want unless we want to, for example. Uh, um, uh, clean water. So this is something that is used uh, for water cleaning, for example, to get rid of all the colloids inside. You just make them coagulate and that's it. Um, now of course we can continue uh, to go on and we, we reach the last possible scenario where if the, um, if the Dubai length is about half of a micron, then in this particular case, you see the, the dark curve is always attractive, essentially. Or if it's repulsive, basically you can't even see it. Okay? And so, of course, in this case, if you look at this particular case, uh, scenario with two particles, then upon being kicked, they would just be kissing each other, going into an irre irreversible well, and nothing can be done anymore. Okay, so of course, this case corresponds as well to an unstable coagulating suspension. So this is how the standard deal theory is actually told and taught. Um, and, and we see that we gain a lot of insight out of it, but we can try to see how people have used this insight to talk about uh, real-life phenomena. Before going into that, I would just I just want to emphasize that the GLV theory has been done in let's say uh, in between the 30s and 40s, okay, in between the uh, the Second World War, and uh, and of course, it's not perfect, okay. It's it's mostly semi-quantitative and explanatory. There are many things that it, it actually misses. 
uh, in particular related to chemistry or physical chemistry, uh, which are not accounted for, um, and, and and that's it. So so I just want to say it's not like a definite theory of how these colloids interact. However, this is the simplest one, and also it has quite like good milestones in terms of what it explains, and that's the reason why it's taught all over the place. So, for example, uh, it's, it's successful at explaining the origin, or at least part of the origin, uh, of the formation of deltas uh, in geology. So, you might know, like having looked at geography, uh, maps, etc., that when a river, when sometimes when a river actually goes into the sea, there is formation of so called deltas, uh, which are pieces of lands. Uh, which across which some some arms of the river have to go in order to uh, to reach the sea, um, and this used to be a puzzle on how these guys actually form, and in fact the way they form is understandable via the Delvio theory. The idea is that you have clay particles which are colloidal particles that are charge stabilized within the uh, river water. That's because it's unsalted. Essentially, there is no salt in it or barely uh, any. And so, when these particles are in charge stabilized suspension, it's entirely fine, moving around, etc., when they reach the highly salted sea water, then of course it increases sometimes 20 or 30 fold the um, uh, concentration in salt, which decreases dramatically the screening length, the Dubai screening length and gives rise to uh, a lower barrier to be passed and then particles can aggregate together and sediment and over a long period of time they can form these deltas. And again this is something uh, that has been only explainable at least again in part by the DLVO theory so it's really one of its great successes. Of course then um, they are, it, explain, it does explain quite a lot of stability of emulsions food and pharmaceutical products. Most of the time if you look in, um, in, in the uh, design and synthesis of these products, they will try to make sure that indeed these colloids or these colloidal suspensions are charge stabilized. Um, and so this is something crucial in terms of, uh, term of semi-quantitative design of such products. Now, it has also been very successful in explaining the actual formation of so-called colloidal crystals, which are crystals uh, with FCC or HCP crystal structures and lattice spicing of the order of a few hundred nanometers. So, at the nodes of the lattice, you've got colloids, and then they are um, laid out in a regular patterns. And people didn't really understand how these things could happen. And this is only, at least partly, within the DLVO theory that you can explain that if the suspension is unstable, then you can't get such things. Because uh, if it's unstable, they will simply aggregate entirely randomly and you would get simply a super disordered mess. And uh, as, you know, as any evidence shows, colloidal crystals are not a single disordered mess. So this is possible within the a um, uh, concept of charge stabilized suspension that emerges emerges within the DLVO theory. Now this is all to basically uh, that I want to say about the DLVO theory itself uh, regarding its own like theory with equations etc and also what were its applications. In the next video, in the last one by the way, uh, we'll look into why is it that people talk about colloids in terms of uh, macroscopic atoms, uh, so why is it so, um, what techniques can be used to tailor the interactions between them, and can we actually discover anything in doing so.